So we have another case of gringos gone wild in Medellin. This is really out of hand, people. This is embarrassing. You need to quit. Uh, so um, marijuana is not legal in Colombia. I know in some places in the world there are uh, movements or legislation to make uh, it legal, and there are dispensaries and things like that in different states in the U.S. now. But it is illegal in Colombia to sell marijuana for any, uh, at any quantity, okay? Um, they have decriminalized to an extent personal possession. So I talked to uh, a friend who's a lawyer. I talked to another friend who's a police officer, and they both confirmed separately that uh, a person might have up to 20 grams um, in possession, which is a little bit, okay, or they can, can have up to 20 plants growing, like if you have a finca, or which is like a country property or something like that, or in your house, and it's strictly for your possession, then uh, the police aren't going to necessarily arrest you or charge you with the crime. But you cannot sell it at all, at any quantities. So they've arrested this guy. It looks like his name is uh, Mr. James Landis. He's 73 years old, according to the police report. And he lived in Sabaneta. Sabaneta is a suburb of Medellin. It's uh, located on the south side of the city. And uh, this guy, Mr. Landis, uh, decided to call himself Cannabis Jimmy, <laughs> which is corny as hell. But anyway... Um, so Mr. Cannabis Jimmy, as he calls himself, set up a website and, uh, as you know, last I looked, it's still there and he's got himself on there with this big, um, like a uh, whole tourism operation, which also in Columbia, if you, if you do anything like related to tourism, there's a separate kind of license that you need, um, but anyway, the, 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 he's charged with, so he sets up this, he's got this website and he's uh, telling you to come to visit him in Sabaneta and he's going to give you a two to three hour marijuana tour uh, and show you his facility. But not only that, um, he's going to sell you the, 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 um, the drugs. And so um uh, the last I looked, I don't know, I guess if you're in jail, it's kind of hard to, to take your website down or, or to manage it, but it was still active. And uh, it says uh, cannabis farm tour .com, owned by California expats catering to North Americans or other. Now, to me, that sounds kind of bigoted, too. So you're going to go to a different country and then set up an operation and then say, we're not going to serve the local people. We're only going to serve people. So I'm going to go to. It's like if you come to the U.S. and you set up a business and say, all right, we're only going to serve Colombians in the U.S. So Americans no need to show up or, or whatever the case is right that, you know, so that's uh, it says father and son team. Uh, we have three products, pre-rolled flour and hash. This is what his website says. He says he has pre-rolled cannabis joints and a handy dandy three pack filled with medical high tech, high TCH cannabis and terpenes they've got a picture of this greenhouse it looks like he set up it says uh two to three hour tour he's got a photo gallery pricing options three levels of pricing high thc medical cannabis is level one uh level two is high thc hawaiian strain cannabis and level three is local columbia cannabis so then it says menu slash price list available by the eighth and quarter and half and one. I don't know if those are pounds or kilos or whatever those are. It says there, pricing options discussed in purpose. Open daily, minimum two people. Um, and so he's got all, you know, so he puts all the evidence up here <laughs> of his crime. And anyway, the police bust him. According to the police, uh, he charged $30 a person 
and uh, gave this two hour, uh, two to three hour tour where he taught you how to process and plant and care for and harvest uh, and maintain this. I'm actually translating the police report here. In addition, this 73 year old person sold the marijuana he harvested to those attending the tour for a value of $20 per gram. On the other hand, the tour could only be booked by foreigners through social networks and a registered uh, website. So not only are you breaking the law uh, by basically selling drugs, but then you're going to be discriminatory uh, and uh, you're only going to do business with foreigners. So anyway, uh, he's in the jailhouse now. In the procedure, 1,380 grams of marijuana, that's about roughly three pounds, um, and elements for its dosage were seized. The foreigner was captured in flagrante delicto. So that's uh, uh, red-handed um, and presented to the attorney general's office. So he's um, in big trouble. And uh, I, I don't know why people, I, I don't know what gets into people's heads. So you're going to go to a different country and you're going to set up an illegal drug operation. I mean, I guess that's nothing new. Uh, but then you're going to make a website uh, and advertise your criminal activity. Uh, so, hey, you know, uh, there, there's people in the world do a lot of a lot of interesting things. And so uh, that's uh, Cannabis Jimmy, who is now in jail in Colombia. Um, there was a web address on the um, website and uh, we reached out to Mr. Cannabis Jimmy for his uh, side of the story is probably hard to answer being in jail or whatever, but we did reach out, um, waited for two or three days, and uh, so far have not heard anything from uh, Mr. Cannabis Jiminy, Jimmy uh, there who uh, is in big trouble. So don't come to Colombia to do stupid things, okay? Don't come to Colombia to do illegal things and selling drugs in Colombia is illegal. Um, but, uh, you know, but this guy not only has this drug operation, but he uh, opens it up and gives people tours of it. So, um, so there you go. So uh, uh, Mr. California Cannabis Jimmy from California is now uh, facing uh, justice in Colombia. And uh, we will try to follow the story to see what happens, if there's any update. Uh, if we hear from Mr. Cannabis Jimmy about his side of the story, then we'll be sure to share that with you. So uh, moving on, uh, so economic news, according to the World Bank, I'll put a link to this report in the um, in the notes. It's a very good report if, if you're into economics and growth and that kind of thing. But uh, Colombia's economic growth is now the worst in Latin America, uh, dropping from an outstanding 7.3% in 2022 to just six tenths of a percent last year. This is uh, this year's forecast at a lame 1.3%. So the country goes from being um, pretty much one of the best in the Americas to um, to just about the worst uh, Ecuador is also doing very bad. Ecuador has, has got some, you know, crisis down there that they're dealing with. Um, but not only that, 277,000 jobs were lost in Colombia between uh, in January and February of this year compared to last year. So that's adjusted for the normal uh, January slowdown because of the retail jobs that um that end after the uh, the Christmas season. But even taking that into account, uh, the economy lost 277,000 jobs. There is a grave concern uh, with uh, employers because of Petro's proposed labor reform. Uh, all of his reforms are failing. He's got three major ones. His health reform was just buried. He's got his labor reform, which will make it harder and more expensive to formally employ people in Colombia. So that's a damper on things like new contact centers coming into Colombia, IT operations. Uh, Petro has already put the brakes on new exp exploration in the petroleum sector uh, with Ecopetrol and then also not giving out licenses uh, for um, petroleum and mining. 
Um, and there's there's really nothing looking at the government's plans that um, are going to compensate for these breaks uh, or for bringing in additional investment, additional foreign direct investment into Columbia that's really dropped off. Normally, you have a lot of new businesses announcing uh, opening locations in Colombia and things like that. But right now there's just so much uncertainty uh, and uh, hate to be pessimistic or the bringer of bad news, but that's not, uh, things aren't going well. And so hopefully there's a turnaround and uh, hopefully, you know, these things are not necessarily uh, permanent, but right now uh, the country is in a rough patch when it comes to economic growth and, and investment. Alvaro Uribe, the former president of Colombia. He was a president from 2000 to 2010, 2002 to 2010, I'm sorry, eight years. And uh, he was widely credited for, for um, making Colombia safe compared to how it had been before when it was under control uh, by the, by the, narco traffickers by the uh, communist insurgents be they the FARC or the ELN um, or there's some other groups EPL and these groups like that um, and when he was president you had uh, Pacho Santos who we interviewed uh, was the vice president and and Pacho Santos's cousin um, Juan Manuel Santos was the uh, he was the finance minister for a while, and then he actually ended up being the defense minister and was very successful, kind of really breaking the back of these communist groups. And anyway, um, when Uribe left office, he was extremely popular. He also uh, kind of endorsed Juan Manuel Santos's run at the uh, presidency. So Juan Manuel Santos, uh, who was in Uribe's camp, became the president but refused to follow, to be a, a puppet of Uribe. So they had a falling out because Santos had his own policies that he wanted to implement and things like that, which really made Uribe furious. And so they ended up becoming kind of uh, political enemies. But unfortunately, um, so anyway, so Uribe um, became a senator after he was uh, president. And uh, he accused a another senator, uh, Ivan Sepa, that who was kind of one. He's a left wing senator uh, in Colombia, but he, he he accused so Uribe accuses Sepa of bribing uh, witnesses to say that Uribe was connected with uh, Paracos or para, paramilitary groups. And a lot of people that's been an accusation, a long standing accusation of Uribe. Uh, Uribe did when he was president negotiate a like a peace process, a partial amnesty for some uh, members of the paramilitary groups like the AUC and things like that. Um, and he has long been accused by his detractors of being uh, close to them. But anyway, so Uribe accuses Sepeda of uh, falsely accusing him. Okay, so the Supreme Court then investigates. Now, if you're a national politician, uh, like the president in Colombia or let's say a senator, only the Supreme Court can investigate you. The regular prosecutors cannot investigate you, okay? And that's to keep, I guess, political favor for, or that's to reduce political in interference. But anyway, when they investigate, so the Supreme Court investigates Uribe and they actually, or they, they investigate these charges that Uribe makes against Sepeda and end up actually clearing Sepeda and charging Uribe with the witness tampering that he had accused Sepeda of. So now, so Uribe gets charged with uh, with um, this procedural fraud and witness tampering um, in 2018. In 2020, they actually uh, uh, they so they they dismiss charges against Sepeda, and then uh, they actually arrest Uribe in 2020. He was briefly held in in house arrest. He got COVID at the time we wrote about it. You can go back and see. So basically, in 2020, Uribe uh, resigns from Congress, and that should move the investigation because when he's in Congress, 
he can only be investigated by the Supreme Court. But by becoming a private citizen, that moves the investigation against him to the Attorney General's office. Now, the Attorney General under Ivan Duque is Francisco Barbosa. Well, that's who Duque appointed, who's uh, a friend of his. I guess they were a friend from back in, in their college days or high school days even. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's he was a uh, personal friend of Ivan Duque, who is the president. Ivan Duque is the political acolyte of uh, Alvaro Uribe. So anyway, good strategy. Uh, Barbosa tries to have the case uh, dismissed, but you can't. he can't unilaterally do that. And it gets shelved, so the case gets stalled, but it, it doesn't go away. So anyhow, we now have um, the, so Barbosa had his term, his term is over and everything like that. And so now there is a new attorney general who was appointed by Petro, um, Luz Adriana Camargo, and she uh, allows the case to go forward. So she's, you know, it's not a ruling or anything like that, but now the, um, as the new attorney general, the case is continuing. There are a lot of witnesses in this case, and um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. You see, Uribe's got this, this complex legacy, as we, we talked about, um, because on one hand, he did um, sort of break the back of these uh, violent um, guerrillas in Colombia, like the FARC and the ELN. But then he also had the case of the false positives, which happened during his administration. And what happened was they were issuing a bounty on um, on militants. So if you're a soldier, you get a prize um, if you kill a, a guerrilla. But what the soldiers were doing now, the, the debate is if Uribe knew about this or not. So there's no real debate on whether this happened or not. But the debate is, okay, did uh, how complicit was Uribe in this? Obviously, it was a bad policy. But um, so he's responsible but did he know about it? Um, my hunch is that he didn't know about the false positives case because it wouldn't really, it wouldn't really make any sense. Uh, there would be no benefit to him. But it was a really a horrible policy that that um, that didn't work. And so what happened was these soldiers would go out to hamlets and and find poor country people who were non-combatants who had nothing to do with the conflict uh, and kill them and dress them up as soldiers and then turn them in for a bounty and turn them in and say, look, I killed this uh, fart gorilla. They would like dress up the corpses as fart gorillas and turn them in. And um, uh, we're still seeing the uh, repercussions of that today in Colombia. A lot of uh, military officers have fortunately gone to jail for this, uh, but it is one of the major ways. And when people say that uh, the government, um, cannot claim to be the good guy in that armed conflict, that's a big part of the reason why is because of the case of the of the uh, false positives is what they called it. You had another case with um, Uribe, his brother actually ended up going to jail for this, and that's the Dose Discipulos, and that is that his brother uh, alleges, allegedly, well, he, he served prison time, um, formed this group of, basically paramilitary. So Uribe's father was a rancher and was a victim. They killed him. Uh, the FARC, I think, killed him or the ELN, uh, but basically the leftist guerrillas. And so to fight back. So when you first had the paramilitary groups that came about because uh, you had these ranchers that, and, and Uribe's from a ranching family, uh, that got together to fight back against these FARC insurgents. And uh, so by forming this group called the 12 disciples or the Dose Discipulos, um, they basically created a paramilitary group. Now, Uribe's, uh, President Uribe's brother uh, went to jail for this. A lot of people are saying that Uribe was a part of it. Um, there hasn't been enough evidence, I think, to convict him in any kind of court. I don't think he's been directly charged of this, but his family certainly is implicated in that. And so then now you have this case uh, going back to 2012 with um, 
Ivan Sepeda and Uribe, starting by saying that Sepeda uh, um, was arranging false witnesses to uh, implicate Uribe with the with the paramilitaries. Then it turns out that, um, or the accusations actually flipped against Uribe. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy and it's kind of convoluted, but. But basically, so now Uribe is going to face trial, it looks like, um, uh, for this case. And uh, he has staunch supporters, uh, of course, Uribistas, as they call him. But he also has a lot of people who um, who are not all leftists either. And that's the thing. The leftist people don't like Uribe anyway because he's just not a leftist guy. Okay, He's kind of like the, the polar opposite of, um, of Gustavo Petro. But there are a lot of people who are not necessarily politically motivated, but really um, see Uribe as a perpetrator of uh, corruption and human rights abuses. And so these are the different opinions of different camps that you have here in Colombia. So this is something to keep an eye on uh, as this case unfolds. Uribe is now, I believe, 72 years old. Um, so it's hard to say what is going to happen. I think it really is a matter of Uribe trying to protect his legacy. I would be surprised if Uribe were ever sent to jail, um, especially at his age. But uh, this is going to, um, at the minimum, affect however his, le his legacy turns out. Now, uh, water rationing. So there, Colombia, because of this, uh, El Nino La Nina effect. I think we're switching uh, from from one phase to another. Uh, there's a lot of serious drought conditions in Colombia. In Medellin, there are drought conditions in the outskirts in the eastern suburbs of Medellin. There's water rationing. Water rationing has now come to the capital. Has come to Bogota. A friend of mine uh, was coming to Colombia a few weeks ago, and he said, "Hey, uh, let's rent a boat and go out to um, to Guatape, which is a reservoir." Uh, and um, I, was like, I sent him a picture. I said, Guatape is mud. It's dry. Um, there's a little bit of water in it. But basically, um, this is a, a concern because it's affecting the water supply. It's affecting, obviously, the ecology with low water flow. Uh, but then Colombia, where 70% of the electrical power comes from hydroelectric generation, it can also end up affecting not just the water supply, but it can end up affecting... Uh, electrical generation. It hasn't got to that point yet, but uh, there already is um, water rationing. And so they turn off water for several hours a day or only turn it on for several hours a day in the worst affected areas. It's not in the whole country. Colombia is a big country, but it is in major population centers like Bogota, like Medellin uh, and other areas as well. Um, moving on, speaking about natural resources, collective mining, which uh, is, was formed by the same group of people that developed continental gold and sold that off. Uh, they now have uh, a, a, um, a mine that's still in the early stages. It's not a mine yet, but it's a, a, an ex exploration site down in uh, the Caldas Department of Columbia near Supia, which is a town in Caldas. They uh, return promising test results for gold, silver, and copper. It looks like uh, that the numbers that they're bringing back uh, which are very good numbers, 30.5% um, copper, one, uh, let's see, wow, 1,280 grams per ton. So that's over a kilogram per ton of silver in the ore. So they, they take the ore and then they say, let's do some tests to try to figure out how much gold is in this ore, or how much uh, silver is in this ore. And they send it off to third-party certified testing um laboratories that are not affiliated so that the results can be presented to investors. Um, and 28.7 grams per ton of gold, which is very high. I'm not an expert. I know a little bit about it. And uh, that's those are very, very good numbers. And so you need a lot less than that um, for it to be uh, commercially valuable. But that number um, it's just one. Now, you have to do a lot of these tests and things like that, and you have to determine not only the grade of the ore that you have in a mine site. So you've got this big, I don't know, side of a mountain or something like that, and you go, okay, there's there's going to be gold in here or silver or whatever mineral you're looking for. Then you're going to have to figure out, one, 
how much ore you have. And that's when they talk about these geological systems. So how much um, of that underlying rock is actually going to be uh, commercially viable ore? How much do you have? And then also the grade of the ore. Is it high grade ore, medium grade, low grade ore? And that's to say the concentration of minerals that you can extract from it. So if you say um, 28.7 grams per ton, so you've got a ton of ore, which isn't that much. That's like, I mean, rock is heavy. So you've got, I don't know, you've got uh, a cubic meter uh, of rock. Uh, that number may be off, but it's not not that much. So you've got all this rock. OK, and then that's 2000 pounds. So let's say you've got, you know, yay, so much rock. And uh, that means that you're going to have. Um, if you have twenty eight point seven grams, that's what's gold right now is something like two thousand dollars an ounce. So it's like several hundred dollars a gram. That's a lot of gold in that right now. You've got to get it out. You've got to process it, blah, 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 and things like that. But that tells you that you have a very high grade of gold in that rock and that is you're able to uh to extract it you also have other minerals like silver and copper and then other minerals that are not that expensive like uh molybdenum and uh tungsten and things like that that are in there so good for continental or for not continental gold but good for collective mining uh which is um trades on the tsx as a cnl and also trades on uh, in the u.s over-the-counter market as CNLMF. Um, it also trades on the Frankfurt Exchange. If you're in Europe, I think it is GG1. But anyway, now, moving along in Medellin, uh, actually this happened in Bogota, but Medellin Mayor uh, Fico Gutierrez met with the U.S. Ambassador Francisco Palmieri, um, and they discussed crime prevention and working uh, collaboratively and the U.S. pledged their support when it comes to, like, sex trafficking and this sexual exploitation and things like that. You know, in my last uh, episode, we talked about the pervert problem that we have. And in the last, I guess, four years uh, before the pandemic or since the pandemic, unfortunately, Medellin kind of got a reputation with some of these creeps as a place to come down to to where... Um, I don't know if the perception was that the government would be lax or the local government or what the case um, is, but you obviously got a problem with the wrong element coming down here uh, to get invade, engaged in, in, in these types of uh, uh, deviant and criminal uh, behaviors. But fortunately, it's great to see that the U.S. government is cooperating with them and uh, they have pledged that, so let this put, creeps on notice because the U.S. government has pledged maximum uh, cooperation. So just because somebody has fled back to the U.S., the U.S. government, which does have an extradition treaty with Colombia, will cooperate to catch these perverts and bring them to justice here in Colombia. Last year, there were several high-profile arrests. They captured some of these uh, child molesters in the U.S. and had them extradited and sent back to Colombia. So not only does extradition go from Colombia to the U.S., but it also goes from the U.S. to Colombia. And so um, it's great to see the close collaboration between uh, the U.S. government and Colombian authorities when it comes to bringing these people to justice. And hopefully this sends the message in that uh, Colombia does not welcome this type of activity. So for those people, they're not going to find any kind of safe refuge or anonymity or anything like that in Colombia. Um, I'll, I'll put the link in. There are some articles that we have talked about. There's a guy, Dominic DiVincenzo, who was in jail in Colombia now um, because of that, uh, because of basically he was creating child porn and things like that. And and then you have um, this other guy that uh, that got caught. What's his name here? They also caught this guy, Timothy Allen Livingston. Um, well, no, they didn't catch him. He actually got away. They had him arrested, but they the police screwed up and didn't. So the police have to go to the prosecutors. The prosecutors have to legalize the arrest in order to hold somebody. The police did not do that. Now the police are being investigated for their incompetency. So Timothy Allen Livingston was able to flee and escape and get to the U.S. 
And uh, now they're looking for him, and there has been an Interpol alert issued for him. And I do know that the um, Colombian and U.S. authorities are, are cooperating uh, regarding bringing uh, Mr. Livingston to justice. So uh, that's another thing that we'll keep an eye on. It's great to see the cooperation between the U.S. and uh, Colombian authorities when the criminal activity involves Americans. So uh, I'm glad to see that myself personally. And obviously, uh, you want to make sure that all of the um, judicial and civil and human rights safeguards are uh, are respected for both the accused as well as uh, the victims in these cases. To leave on a positive note, something really fun is coming up. This event uh, I've attended for years. I'll tell you something really fun. If you're going to be in Colombia, if you're going to be in Medellin in May, uh, the the Feria de Dos Ruedas, which translates as the, the two-wheel fair, but it's the largest motorcycle industry event in Latin America. And it's attended by any, if you're, you know, if you're a motorcycle enthusiast like I am, uh, you know, I miss, I used to have, I have a motorcycle in Colombia. I had a motorcycle uh, back in the States, I had a Honda CBR, uh, four cylinder, uh, 600, um, love that motorcycle. But anyway, if, if you, if you're a, a motorcycle enthusiast, or if you're in the business, especially if you're in the business, then this can't miss an event. It's a lot of fun, whether, you know, even if it's, if, if you don't have a business reason to go, you want to go and check this out. It takes over all of Plaza Mayor, which is the downtown convention center in Medellin, uh, the May 2nd. It is industry only. So if you have to kind of be in the motorcycle industry um, and and you have to pre-register to get your credentials and such and such. But from May 3rd to May 5th, which is Friday, Saturday and Sunday, it's open to the public. Uh, it's a lot of fun. This, there, Even if you're not that into motorcycles, I am. But even if you're not, it's a really fun event. It's, it's you know, it's family friendly. Uh, they have stunts and things like that. They've got performers. They've got contests. They've got music. Uh, you know, but they've got then. But then they've got everything from the major motorcycle manufacturers, and then the people that sell the accessories, and the importers and exporters, and all the global brands and everything like that are there. So it's put on by a company called Prisma. Um, uh, I know Don Guillermo, who is the, the president and the guy who organized this event. But if you're going to be in, in Medellin, it's really even worth traveling to Medellin for it. So make sure to get that on your schedule. F2R, Feria de, de Dos Ruedas. I'll put the link in the website. On the days that it's open to the public, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you can just show up and buy a ticket there on the spot. You've got to buy a ticket and then go get in. But if you're... um. In the industry, you want to go to the website. There's going to be uh, academic sessions. You have, for example, like the people that make motor oil are going to be there and they talk about their latest uh, innovations in lubricant technology. Then the helmet people are going to be there and they talk about the new, you know, uh, latest things to protect your being. Uh, and then, and just everything is there. It's going to be this real serious stuff. There's real fun stuff. But go to Feria de Dos Redes. That event is super cool. So anyway, I think that's going to be enough for, for this week. We've cut or, covered a bunch of things. Um, I'll put links to a lot of the things that we've talked about um, uh, here in the show notes. And remember to not only obviously subscribe, uh, very thankful for that, obviously um, to click like because that tells YouTube that this video is worth um, presenting to others. But my favorite thing of all, um, is comments. So let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about what we've talked about here, uh, your opinions on these different things. But my favorite thing is all of all, because that lets me know that you're actually paying attention uh, and engaged with what we're talking about here. So please, please, if you do anything, leave me a comment. Even if you think that I suck and I don't know what I'm talking about and uh, stupid gringo or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, just, you know, I don't care. Tell me, tell me what you think. And appreciate that. So above everything, practice critical thinking, um, stay mentally and physically active, and above all, be kind to yourself and others.